Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution for the detailed analysis of the current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles dated 14th February 2023 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us this article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 1st and talks about the draft which was introduced with respect to the legislation in order to provide the regulatory framework for the protection of geo heritage site and geo relics in India got a recent criticism from various sections of society. According to this article, many scientists that is geo scientists and paleontologists have condemned the bill with the name Draft Geo Heritage Site and Geo Relics Prevention and Maintenance Bill 2022. Now we are going to discuss this bill in length and breadth and also the basics of geo heritage sites and geo relics with some of the best examples. As far as relevance of this topic is concerned or why we have taken this topic as a primary one for today's DNS, the reason is that it covers three important sections of your GS paper 2 in the mains examination. The first one is that it talks about the functions and the conduct of business which also includes the passage of various bills by the parliament and the state legislation. It also talks about the structure and organization of the executive because here we are going to discuss about the geological survey of India and also the relevance of this topic with respect to the ministry of mines. And thirdly, this topic is important under the statutory and regulatory bodies of India. As far as previous context is concerned, so in 2018, a question with respect to Indian art heritage was asked with respect to the safeguarding that should be taken up for the preservation of Indian art heritage. Going by the same trend, today we are going to discuss this bill in detail. This bill was introduced to protect the Indian geological heritage. Now, geological heritage simply means that any heritage which is defined on the basis of geology that is rocks. So whatever geological sites are there in India are based on the rocks and their various formation. For example, there might be a basalt, there might be sedimentary rock or there could be some other granite formation. If they show some unique examples, if they show some unique formation, they might be taken up as a geo heritage site and the samples that are collected from there could be the geo relics. This could be in the form of fossils, which also include the fossils from the wood, sedimentary rocks, natural structures created by various processes, both exogenic and endogenic. Now there was a concern which was raised because some of the geoscientists and the paleontology believe that the powers which were vested, that is the entire power of the bill, talks about that the functions of geo heritage site and geo relics will now be completely under the Geological Survey of India, which comes under the Ministry of Mines. And instead of that, the people demanded that there should be a committee of experts which should have members from the subject experts, let's say geoscientists and paleontologists and should work on the democratic principle rather than the top-down approach. This will also act as a wider range of institution. There will be more people, more decision making and there will be easier regulation of the geo heritage sites. However, this is not the only provision of the bill. The important provision of the bill includes the power of GSI to declare a site as a geo heritage site. So now it is the power of the GSI or Geological Survey of India to declare any site to be a site of geo heritage. They can take the possession of relics even which are in the private hand. Let's say there is a evidence of geology from a particular cave or a geology from a particular basalt or the igneous rock. If it is under the possession of a private person that can be taken over by the Geological Survey of India as per this bill. It also prohibits the construction in any form 100 meter around a particular site to make it more protected. And lastly, it also penalizes and even fine up to 5 lakh rupees or even the possible imprisonment for vandalism, defacement 
or the violation of the directions given by the director general of gsi now the question arises that what are these sites why they are important and what could be the possible benefit of bringing such a legislation as far as need for such a bill is concerned we are going to discuss that but before that let's discuss about the basic definition of geo heritage and geo relics geo heritage sites are the one which are rare unique in geology and their geomorphological significance they might have any particular geomorphology mineralogy petrology paleontology and even stratigraphic significance which might include some specific caves natural rock sculptures of national and international interest on the other hand geo relics are any relics or a small material of that geological significance it might be a sediment rock mineral or even the meteorites or the fossils if these are found at a particular location they are known as geo relics and that location might be called as geo heritage but all these sites and relics will now fall under the control of geological survey of india according to this bill now once this bill is passed it will benefit a larger section of the scientist but why do we need such kind of a bill india is a party to unesco's convention on protection of world cultural and natural heritage now cultural heritage you can easily understand let's say through dance forms or through paintings on the other hand natural heritage might include the mountains the rock formation natural forest and even other things the objective of this convention was to ensure the effective and active measures taken to protect conserve and present of the natural and the cultural heritage within a country's territory let's say if india is protecting its heritage of certain tribes across the nation it is actually fulfilling its commitment towards the convention of unesco apart from this convention india is also party to the international union or conservation of nature it's an ngo and under this ngo's resolution 2015 India is also committed towards the preservation of geo diversity and geo heritage. India does not have any law or any specific legislation or policy with respect to the conservation of geo heritage as of now. So for providing the conservation for the future generation in this regard, a legislation is need of the hour. India is also going through the deterioration and the disappearance of many of the geo heritage, especially the stones which are relevant for the mineralogy. India need to provide them the right amount of protection. India is a land of geo diversity. We have old, one of the oldest mountain chains in the form of Aravalli. We have a young fold mountains in the form of Himalayas. We have one of the densest forest. We have the areas which receive one of the highest rainfall. We have ice caps, glaciers and even the driest deserts. So that kind of geo diversity is important. and having the world's greatest geological events india has ever observed requirement of their preservation is important and the last important reason is that we need to preserve and protect such kind of sites for the geological studies education research and even for the future generation as a non renewable asset once lost they are not going to be returned back now once government has decided to bring such a law it will provide long term benefit the first one it is going to preserve and protect the geological heritage in india for sure now it is having a legal backing it is going to provide the regulatory framework how to protect when to protect who is going to be the right authority who will take what responsibility and that all to be executed in an organized manner it is going to promote the geo tourism so once they are protected they will be mass campaigned they will be advertised people will be invited to visit those places for example we have lonar lake in maharashtra which is now developing more as a tourist spot then once a law is in place we will have more identification of such sites because now we have legal backing on that it will also help in fulfilling india's international commitment and also come up as a key player in the international platform where india can also boost itself with respect to the availability of regulatory framework in this regard and lastly such a bill will help in the mass awareness and the sensitization of the citizens and their role towards the protection of geo heritage 
Now, if we talk about the basic geo heritage, India as of now have 32 such geo heritage sites. The largest number of such sites are in Rajasthan, as you can see, right from the site number 12 to the site number 21. The total number of sites as of now are 32, which are recognized by the Geological Survey of India. Total number of states which are recognized here are 13 and there is no union territory which consists such site. You can go by this list. It is given in the PDF, given in the description box. You can go through the sites. These are 32 in number and they are covering almost entire region of India. Four examples that we have taken on the screen are these are the natural geological arc. As you can see, this is an arch on your screen. So this is an arch. This is a geological arch and it is found in the Tirumala Hills of Andhra Pradesh. The another example here is the Akal Fossil Wood Park. The wood that you can see on the screen. These are the wooden blocks and these are the fossils. These are not very young ones. The third example shows the Lunar Lake. It was created. It is believed to be created by a meteor and it is situated in Maharashtra. And the last example that we have taken is the Peninsular Genes. It is a rock formation from lava and it is situated in the city of Bangalore. Now with this entire discussion, we are going to look into this question. Safeguarding the Indian Geo heritage is the need of the moment. So you have to identify why do we need to provide safeguard. In the light of the statement, analyze, that is go with the pros and cons of the geo heritage site and geo relics bill 2022 in the protection of geo heritage in India. Try to answer this question in 250 words. So you have to answer three dimension. Why we need to safeguard? What are the benefits that this draft bill is going to bring? And what are the limitations? Let's now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 14 that is the business page and talks about the suggestion given by Indian Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman for the G20 countries to come up with a common standard operating procedure on the cryptocurrency for its regulation. Now India is the host for G20 this year so India is now gaining more currency towards bringing more and more reforms through the platform of G20. Now the context says that the finance minister has called for the standard operating protocol or procedure among the member nation of G20 to regulate the crypto assets. And crypto assets are nothing but the cryptocurrency themselves. Now why India is looking for a common standard procedure? Because crypto sector is now evolving more, it requires significant international collaboration. Legislations made by a single nation, let's say India, are not going to meet the purpose internationally because crypto works on the digital platform. One country coming up with a regulation is not going to benefit the entire world in totality. Hence, India is now looking to lay down a single procedure or SOP for all the countries across the world to follow in respect to the cryptocurrency. And as G20 is one of the major economic grouping, which controls almost 80% of the world GDP, if come up with such an important standard operating protocol, can set an example for other countries to follow. Now, before going deeper into the discussion of the cryptocurrency, let's talk about the definition first. Cryptocurrency is a digital virtual money. You cannot have a physical copy of a cryptocurrency and act as a medium of exchange over internet. Right? You can only use cryptocurrency through the digital manner. It is not used through the physical manner. This currency is organized and monitored by a peer-to-peer -peer network which is called a blockchain, also called as a ledger, where all the transactions are secured and shows the buying and selling and transferring of the cryptocurrency. That how many times this currency was bought, how many times this currency was sold and how many times it shifted from one owner to the other. All these transactions are stored in a blockchain ledger. It is not issued by any government. It is mined through the computer program. It is not even issued by any financial institutions like RBI. It can be launched, mined. Mined means to create cryptocurrency and it can be distributed by any private person. And that is the reason 
बिकॉज इफ एनी वन कैन कंट्रोल क्रिप्टो करेंसी इट इज अ मैटर ऑफ कंसर्न एंड हाउ कैन अ सेंट्रल बैंक इन रिस्पेक्ट टू द कंट्रोलिंग ऑफ एन इकोनमी अलाउ द क्रिप्टो करेंसी टू वर्क स्मूथली एंड दैट इज द रीजन वाई इन द रीसेंट पास रिजर्व बैंक ऑफ इंडिया हैज शोन रिजर्वेशन एज वेल एज कंसर्न विद रिस्पेक्ट टू द रेगुलेशन ऑफ क्रिप्टो करेंसी इन द कंट्री now we are going to discuss about the basics of cryptocurrency india's current status and how it has been regulated so far in india we are also going to look into the taxation on the cryptocurrency and what benefit such kind of move will bring for the g20 nations in the future if they come up with a common protocol to control and regulate the cryptocurrency now Cryptocurrency in this country can be used for number of purposes including payment of taxes freely convertible to the other currencies and payment for goods and services if you are a person who is living in el salvador you can easily buy goods and services from the market pay your taxes through the use of cryptocurrency bitcoins however as far as india is concerned we have a very brief history of what cryptocurrency in india is and how it is actually being practiced well in india cryptocurrency is not illegal to trade it means if you are trading in cryptocurrency government cannot impose any penalty on you however at the same time there is no regulatory framework in india to control the use and trading of cryptocurrency many of the private exchanges which are dealing in the cryptocurrency are already working in india for example the wazir x it deals in trading that is buying and selling of cryptocurrency in india however when it comes to the government stand on the cryptocurrency we will observe that it is yet evolving take for instance in 2018 rbi has issued a circular to all the financial institutions including banks to not provide services or the entities which are dealing in the virtual currencies the term used by the rbi was virtual currencies However after this circulation government actually constituted a separate committee under Subhash Chandra Garg and this committee recommended a ban on the private cryptocurrencies the committee says that there are concerns such as volatility instability security risk and risk of funding illegal activities attached with the cryptocurrencies however this committee also came up with a favor of official digital currency that can be issued by the RBI in 2020 what happened that there was a case which was going on in the supreme court and this case was internet and mobile association of india versus reserve bank of india in which supreme court has stuck down 2018 circular of RBI it ruled that RBI's move will actually violate people's fundamental right to carry on any occupation trade or business under article 191g of the constitution well the argument of the supreme court was simple that whatever people are doing and if it is not generating any illegal activities because when you read the article 192 you will find that all these benefits or all these kind of freedoms have their restrictions attached to them so the supreme court has ruled that while the rbi has power to regulate virtual currencies the prohibition imposed through the april 2018 circular is disproportionate and therefore ultra vires the constitution recently in 2021 two important development already taken place in india first one was that the rbi has decided to withdraw its 2018 circular after the supreme court order which means that rbi no longer can restrict the cryptocurrency use in india and secondly government has come up to introduce a cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill 2021 which is likely to be introduced in the coming monsoon session of the parliament the bill seeks to provide two different avenues first it ban all private cryptocurrencies in india as well as it provide for the issuance of official digital currency by rbi on the recommendation of the subhash chandra garg committee in 2019 well what does it means it means that in the new future if this bill become an act 
Reserve Bank of India would be allowed to provide digital currencies which you and me can use through the digital purposes including your e-wallets, your internet banking and other means. However, you will never ever get those currencies in physical form in your pocket. So those digital currencies will be used only for the digital payments and nothing else. Now, there are many advantages and disadvantages which are attached to the Bitcoins and of course the cryptocurrency in general. The advantages include the potential of higher returns because the returns attached to the Bitcoins are exponential. Protection from payment fraud because it is cryptography which is attached to the mining of this currency. Hence, the payment frauds are negligible. It also includes immediate settlement and international transaction because you do not need any kind of conversion of the currency from one form to the other or from one uh, denomination to the other, the international payments become instant and easier. And it attached to the diversification with higher liquidity. On the disadvantage side, there are high volatility and the potential of large losses. Because once there is an exponential high in the returns, it may also go into the downward side and can create high losses. It is also likely that it will promote the black market activity because these currencies are not regulated in India by RBI. The next being the unregulated and unbagged and cyber hackings are attached to these kind of payments. And lastly, if you are going through the loss in the cryptocurrency, you are not likely to get refund under any circumstances. So these are the pros and the cons of using cryptocurrency as far as India's economy is concerned and because of these issues, government as well as RBI is very skeptical when it comes to the use or regularization of the bitcoins in India. As far as taxation policy on cryptocurrency is concerned, so in the last budget that is the finance bill of 2022, Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman proposed to levy a 30% tax on the transfer of virtual assets including the cryptocurrencies. And this has brought a new section of 115BBH to the Income Tax Act. Now please pay attention. The taxation imposed on the cryptocurrency is going to be the part of income tax and not the GST. It is not going to be the part of corporate tax or any other custom or duty. It is going to be the part of income tax in India. As far as benefit of such a move is concerned, so what will happen if there is a common policy and regulation on the crypto across the world? The first is that it will bring a common regulatory framework. So whatever India is doing is the same as the European countries are doing is the same as what China and US are doing. So they will have the same and common regulatory framework. A person going for or against the law will have to go by the same provisions. It will enhance the cooperation on laws. So if India is making a particular law or if China is making a particular law, they are going to find a enhanced cooperation because they are created on the same lines. There will be common laws which can help in the identification of a fraud if there is any fraud because now the laws are same. So intra-country coordination will be more. There will be a better financial coordination among the member because they have the same rules. So whether you talk about the Reserve Bank of India, whether you talk about the Bank of Japan or Bank of England or any other bank, there will be more financial coordination and there can be ease of coordination. It will provide ease of taxation on the cryptocurrencies because once the laws are same, taxation would be equalized. G20 countries almost contribute 80 to 85 percent of the world GDP. Hence, once they adopt this provision, it will be replicated by the other countries. Hence, the benefits of such a common policy will be manifold. It also provides intra-agency cooperation among the member countries. For example, National Investigation Agency of India and Central Intelligence Agency of US can easily cooperate with respect to the cryptocurrency and the black money generated over there. With this discussion place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared as a part of editorial in which the writers have talked about formality of the constitutional oath taken by various offices. Now we are not going to go deeper into the arguments which were laid by these writers because these arguments are not going to be the part or parcel of the UPSC syllabus. What we are going to look into is the important section of constitutional oath 
and which offices across India are liable to take oath in affirmation with respect to their offices. So, we are going to look into the constitutional oath, constitutional provisions and basic differences between the various oath with a special reference to the scheduled third of the Indian constitution. The context says that the third schedule of the Indian constitution provides for oath or affirmation of important constitutional dignitaries which includes president, vice president, governors, even the council of minister. Now the basic difference between oath and affirmation is a person's allegiance to the religion. In case of oath, a person refers to his allegiance towards God, while in terms of being atheist, the oath taken is known as affirmation. The basic ground of taking affirmation is one's own soul and conscience. Now why do a person take an oath? The first reason is that through the oath, a person binds towards his performance in the constitutional duties which is also known as oath of the office. Once a person holds the constitutional office, let's say he or she is a minister to a particular ministry or he or she is the vice president, president, governor to the particular constitutional office. So they have a particular responsibility towards that office. So they are going to take the oath of office. It also prohibits, prevents these people who take the oath from committing any unconstitutional or illegal act. It also upholds the sovereignty of India as well as the integrity, faith and allegiance towards the constitution. And lastly, it also operates on the principle of secrecy. And such an oath does not allow these members to divulge the important and sensitive information to the people. For example, a ministry, let's say the Home Ministry, is working towards prevention of terrorism in India. So that ministry or that minister cannot allow the sensitive information to fall in the hands of terrorists. In that manner, he or she is going to prevent the divulgence of the information, hence taking the oath of secrecy. However, only the ministers are responsible to take the oath of secrecy. President, vice president, governors are not. And we are going to look into the basic differences of all these in the following discussion. One important note here is that whatever may be the person taking the office, that member who is taking the oath may take the oath or affirmation in English or any other language which is specified in the 8th schedule of the Indian constitution which includes 22 languages except English. Now let's start with the comparison of various articles that talk about the oath and affirmation. The first is the Article 75, Clause 4 and Article 164, Clause 3. Both of them are talking about the ministers who take office at the center and the state. Article 75 is for the ministers in the union government. Article 164 is for the ministers in the state government. And both of them take the oath with respect to the president and the governor. And they take the oath of office and the oath of secrecy according to what is mentioned in the third schedule. If we go into the oath of office and oath of secrecy, the basic difference are as follows. Although both are made in the name of God or solemnly affirms, so the second one is affirmation, the first one is oath. In the first one, that is oath of office, that particular person calls for their allegiance to the Indian constitution to uphold the sovereignty and integrity of India. That means whatever they will do in the office will not harm the sovereignty and integrity in India. They will be faithful and conscientiously discharge their particular duties and will try to do right to all the manners of people in according to the Indian constitution without fear or favor, that is of course the corruption, affection, ill or will. The second thing that is oath of secrecy of a minister for the union or for the state says that indirectly they will not reveal or communicate to any person any matter that shall be brought under their particular consideration or become known to that person or a minister except 
as may be required for the due discharge of his or her duties as a minister let's say that particular minister is required to speak in the parliament on the question which were raised by the member of parliament through their own following powers as a minister he or she has to speak out on the functioning of his office otherwise he or she has to keep up with the secrecy so this is the basic difference the first one talks about their duties the second one talks about their secrecy the second group of oath and information are found in article 99 for union and 188 for the state which talks about the oath and information taken by the member of legislative assembly to a particular state or the member of parliament and these are taken with respect to the president and the governors and they are taken under the provisions of third schedule the on the similar line we have oath and affirmation for the judges at supreme court and the high court where the oath is taken in front of president or the governor and these are mentioned under article 124 and 219 the same is mentioned in third schedule and the last is the article 148 clause 2 which talks about the oath and affirmation taken by the computer and auditor general of india to the president as per the third schedule now these are the four group of oath and affirmation which are mentioned in the constitution hence as per the article the article was talking about the constitutional oath and nothing beyond this now if we go through the basic provision of the third schedule as you can see this is your third schedule where oath and affirmation of ministers at the union with respect to the office and the secrecy candidates fighting for the election to the parliament member of parliament judges to the supreme court cag minister of the state for office and secrecy candidate fighting elections to the state members of legislative assembly or the mla and judges to the high court are mentioned and these are the following articles that are part of these oath and affirmation now one thing is important there is no mention of president vice president or even the governor in this list so where they are they have found a special mention with respect to their oath and affirmation in article 60 159 and 69 so all these three articles talks about the oath and affirmation of president and governor mentioned separately every president and governor or any person acting as that office will take oath and affirmation with respect to the chief justice of india in case of president and high court chief justice in case of governor if these are not available senior most judge of the respective will take the oath and this oath and affirmation president and governor are going to discharge and will work with the best of their abilities to preserve protect and defend please try to follow these three important terms but because when we talked about the oath and affirmation of the other people like minister of the state or the high court judge or even the cag preservation protection and defending of the indian constitution was not mentioned here they are going to preserve protect and defend the indian constitution and the law and they will devote themselves to the service and the well being of the people of india here also they are taking the oath or the affirmation the same is true with respect to the vice president but here the oath is taken in front of the president and not the cji one more important difference that we should focus upon is that the second schedule which talk about the emoluments actually mention those three offices which were not mentioned in the third schedule that is president governor the chairman of the council that is the vice president vice president is not mentioned in second schedule so be aware of these small important facts now with this discussion please let us now move to the next article for the day this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 1 which says supreme court has uphold the constitution of Jammu Kashmir delimitation panel now we are going to go deeper into the entire issue find out what is the real concern in this manner and we are also going to look into the basics of the delimitation commission today the context says this article is important very very important with respect to your general studies paper 2 in the constitutional non constitution statutory and regulatory body section the context says that supreme court on monday that is yesterday dismissed a challenge 
to the constitution of Jammu Kashmir delimitation commission which was constituted recently to readjust the constituencies in the new union territory now since 2019 union territory of Jammu and Kashmir is the new entity as there was a new entity there was a requirement which was felt with respect to the delimitation commission as the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir was divided into two union territories, new delimitation commission was the need of the hour because until unless delimitation commission is available, election conduction is very very tough. Because some of the seats were given to the union territory of Ladakh and because of this readjustment in the aerial situation of the state, delimitation commission was very much required. And because of the same, a commission was set up. Now, first of all, what is delimitation? Now, before dwelling into why the commission was set up, you should know what is delimitation. Delimitation means the limitation which is imposed on a particular area, on the particular resident or the habitant about the behavior of their voting, about their right to vote and where they can actually vote. For example, let's say this is a particular area which was erstwhile a single unit. Delimitation Commission has divided this area into two, area A and area B. Now the people who were urged while residing in the single area could vote any person. But now a person who is residing in area A cannot vote to a person who is residing in area B if there are two constituencies. And these two constituencies are divided on the basis of population many other parameters which are ultimately decided by the Delimitation Commission. Until and unless there is a delimitation commission, how can we identify what population should vote to what candidate? So here is the important role of delimitation commission which enjoys his power from the act created by the parliament and parliament ultimately enjoys the power given by the constitution of India. So this commission was set up. The reason is that after 2019 when Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act was passed, assembly seat count and delimitation was required because it was divided into two. In the former state of JNK, delimitation was conducted according to the JNK representation of the People's Act 1957, which determines the seats and their boundaries, that what is the actual boundaries of a particular constituency. However, when it comes to the Lok Sabha seats or the Rajya Sabha seats, it was based on the Indian constitution and not JNK representation of the People's Act. There was a discrepancy in both these things. Following the revocation of Article 370 in 2019, Constitution will now dictate how the assembly seats are going to be allocated. See the difference. Previously, Indian Constitution never talked about how assembly seats are going to be distributed. That is how seats for the MLA are going to be decided. But now as the status has been revoked, now Union Government through the Delimitation Commission can determine the number of seats and their aerial distribution. So, in March 2020, Delimitation Commission under Ranjana Prakash Desai, a retired judge of a Supreme Court, was created. Now, what the court has observed? The court has said that Article 2 and 3 of the Indian Constitution, which you should go through, provides that Parliament can create new state or the Union Territory, which is an obvious thing. Jammu Kashmir Reorganization Act assign the role of readjustment to the constituencies to the delimitation commission and delimitation commission is enjoying the power of the parliament which can create a new state so ultimately according to article 2 and 3 creation of delimitation commission is not unconstitutional and it can be created on the whims and fancies of the parliament law which is made under article 3 can provide for the readjustment of any new state according to the Supreme Court. Hence, the Delimitation Commission created for the Jammu and Kashmir is completely constitutional as stated by Supreme Court yesterday. Now, the point is what this commission has to say. But before venturing into this commission, we should understand what Delimitation Commission is all about. After understanding the basic provisions of the Delimitation Commission, we are going to look into the modifications which were made by this specific commission and why this excise has been the controversial till now. Now we come to the revision of what delimitation commission is. We have already done this previously also but so in that case we will take it in brief. Delimitation means the act of redrawing the boundaries of Lok Sabha or the state assembly that we have discussed which should represent the equal population for the each and every seat. 
This delimitation exercise is given under Article 82 of the Indian Constitution that empowers the Parliament to, to legislate a separate delimitation act from time to time for this exercise. For your information, delimitation commission is created under the delimitation act. It is not mentioned directly in the Constitution of India. So you have to have a clear idea on that. Under the Constitutional Amendment 84, and 87. There was a separate delimitation act which was created in 2002. Similarly, it was created three times in the past also. But as we have said, most of the time the delimitation exercise is based on the population as an important parameter. And that is the reason why the populous states are getting benefit and the less population states are getting disadvantage on this commission's report. Delimitation Commission, which is created under this Act, fixes the limit or the boundaries of the territorial constituency. That is, outside this constituency, people will not be able to vote for that constituency's candidate. It is a single exercise for the entire nation. Separate Delimitation Commission for a specific state is created only under certain conditions. For instance, some of the states in Northeast India because of the security concerns, were not able to conduct the delimitation exercise in 2002. So it was created later on. Another issue arises with respect to delimitation is that it cannot be called in question in any court of law. Its copies are although laid down in the houses of people and the state assembly, but they are not allowed to bring any modification. Secondly, anything done by the delimitation commission is not subjected to the alteration. Although before the implementation of the report, n number of changes can be made. But that is subjected to the members of the commission and not the outsider body. So now we come to the concern. The first one is the exercise is restricted by the constitution because since 2002, the demographic dividend of India has changed considerably. And the next exercise which is going to be conducted four years down the line, that is 2022, will have a gap of 24 years that is enough to bring a drastic change in the population parameter. So this frozen of the seat is not a good idea. Then, frozen of the seat is not only limited to the general category but also to the STSC population which remains outside the ambit of good welfare in the country. Then, we have seen that despite the abrogation of Article 370 and the sub of the material, delimitation exercise was conducted in these two union territories without court's order. There is no legislative representation in the commission as we have seen there is one judicial member and two members from the election commission. And last, commission is not at all accountable to any authority in India. So whatever they say is taken for granted, which also opens for high level of discretion, misuse of power and even the political patronage by these members. Coming to the basic modifications which were made by this commission. The first one, the commission suggested that legislative assembly will have more seats now. And this has been increased to 47 against 43 previously. How? New six seats has been increased in the area of Jammu. They have also altered the current design of the assembly seats and their distribution. As far as Lok Sabha is concerned, so there are five parliamentary districts which are available. They have changed the basic borders of three areas, Anantnag and Jammu, Peer Panjal, including the Punch and the Rajori area because they can do it. They can delimit a particular area. As far as Shia dominated portion is concerned, in the Srinagar parliamentary district has been moved to now Baramula district. So they have also changed the demographic dividend. As far as Kashmiri Pandits are concerned or the Kashmiri Hindus which were asked while living in those areas will now get two representation in the legislative assembly which was not previously there. Not only that, even nine seats have been provided to the scheduled tribe to the state. Now this is given according to the reservation provision. And even those people who were displaced on the creation of Pakistan occupied Kashmir and who got relocated to the Jammu after the partition will now get representation. So this is a basic provision given by this delimitation commission. Now once this report was out, there was a controversy. Why? 
the first reason was that it has redrawn only jammu and kashmir despite the fact that number of seats and their delimitation was frozen till 2026 then how they can change it last delimitation exercise in jammu kashmir was carried in 1995 in 2002 the delimitation of jammu and kashmir was frozen till 2026 hence no change should be taken up this was challenged in the high court of jammu and kashmir and even the supreme court and both the courts upheld the freeze that is these seats and delimitation should not be changed before 2026 however it was changed the second concern is that usually delimitation commission calculates or redesign the seats of the constituencies on the basis of population but this time they have included the size remoteness and even the closeness of a particular district to the borders or the international borders maybe for the security reasons why this is so so these were the basic concerns however as the supreme court has highlighted that it is completely constitutional for this delimitation commission to bring the changes now the only solution given to the petitioner would be to file a review petition to the judgment given that's all for today's daily news simplified thank you for watching the video do subscribe to the channel for more such updates